Arbor trees, they're a new and very useful plant here and oxygen not included. However, if you've ever looked into the question of what it takes to turn lumber into something useful like power, oxygen, or water, it's actually a much more complicated topic than it first appears. So at first glance, this looks incredibly complicated, and it is, but don't worry, I actually have a whole flow chart and everything, so we're going to break this down and run through it step by step to understand the two different things that are going on here. And what is actually happening here is I'm taking lumber up here on the top left, and I'm outputting cool oxygen right down here. So this is producing oxygen at 12 degrees Celsius, and it's also giving me a little extra power. So how am I doing this? Okay, so the first thing you need to understand here is that there's two different systems that are connected here. We have an ethanol loop over here on the left, and then we have a cooling loop, that's kind of crazy, over here on the right. So let me explain what's happening on the left here. Essentially, we have arbor trees that are growing up either planted or wild. In my case, they're going to be wild. That gives off lumber. We use the ethanol distiller right here and that outputs ethanol into its liquid tank. That liquid tank then feeds the petroleum generator down here which can burn either petroleum or ethanol. The, the polluted water drips out of here and then we run it through a water sieve like this to output water. Uh, the excess power can be stored or distributed in batteries and whatnot. And what we're also getting out of the water sieve down here is polluted dirt by converting filtration medium, which is like sand or regolith, and that's how we get polluted dirt out of it, which can then be run through compost and gives us the output of dirt. So per my arrangement back here, and based on the calculations, for every one kilogram of lumber burnt, we produce 134 watts, 188 grams a second of water, 341 grams per second of dirt, and we use up 38 grams a second of filtration medium and we're also producing heat inside of our base at the rate of 14,500 DTUs. Now I made all my calculations here using a spreadsheet over here and essentially what I'm doing here is calculating the duty cycle. So I know that I want to run an ethanol distiller at 100% right here and then everything else lets me know what I need to achieve that and all of its byproducts. So you can see this is where all the numbers are output down here. So what this lets me know is that if I wanted to do planted trees, I would need three planted trees, or if I were growing them wild, I would need 12 of them. So when it comes to planting arbor trees, I actually made a video just yesterday that talked about how you can use pips to plant them in farms and make them set up like this, or like this up here, essentially. So you can check that video out in the top right. Ultimately, it's not too hard to actually plant up a bunch of arbor trees and make that work. So while this loop seems relatively straightforward and that amount of heat really isn't that bad, there is a catch. And that catch is in how the water is output from the petroleum generator. So if you take a look at this and you look at the details of this by clicking on this and then mousing over the polluted water, it says it will be at least 40 degrees Celsius or hotter if the building is hotter. So if you've played oxygen not included for a long time, or if this is just new to you, this is a very important detail because it's new to the game. Because what we have now is we have a minimum temperature that it will be output at, plus anything extra. So trying to keep this petroleum generator cool is our biggest concern because if we don't we end up with a runaway situation where this keeps getting hotter and outputs hotter water and that we have to manage that hot water in our base it isn't really all that useful and the whole thing starts to spiral out of control and we end up with a lot of heat in our base so that gets us into a couple of cooling methods now i'm using a method down here which is a little bit different but there's there's more than one way to tackle heat the traditional way is to use a steam turbine and then a thermal aqua tuner down here. In case you're new to this, essentially the input temperature here goes through this aqua tuner and it comes out 14 degrees cooler. However, all of that thermal energy that it took to you know, move that heat is then dissipated through the aqua tuner. So that's why we put a steam turbine above that which takes thermal energy and converts it into electricity. This is not a net gain. You're, you're not generating extra power by this, but what you're doing is moving thermal energy out of a loop and turning it into power. So essentially this is the cooling loop. You'd set this up to be relatively cold, let's say 20 degrees Celsius, and you can run that around your base to make sure that things don't get too hot. Okay, Brothgar, so that's cool and all, but what in the world is this? Well, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a heat flusher, 2.0. Okay, so here's how this heat flusher works. Connected to the thermal aqua tuner here is a loop that you want to keep cool. 
Okay, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of it. But essentially, there is a loop of liquid over here that is flowing around everything that I want to cool, which is all of this equipment and this little area right down here where I'm going to flow my oxygen through on the way out. So cold water flows in and then hot water flows out over here. And then the thermal aqua tuner cools that water again and dissipates the heat into this environment up top. So as the water moves in past the aqua tuner, it will heat up and therefore cool down the environment that it's passing through. And as the hydrogen is put out of the electrolyzers up here, it will actually absorb that thermal energy so that it goes up to temperature in a loop like this. And it just keeps circulating around until it reaches a nice high temperature. And then at that point, it's kicked out into a hydrogen generator where it is burnt for, to produce power. And because it's burnt to produce power, that thermal energy gets deleted. So ultimately what we're left with here is excessive cooling capacity. Now I can't guarantee that this number is 100% correct. I did try to do the calculations as, as close as I could, but it seems relatively accurate in that it is minus 63 DTUs. And that number can vary significantly if you end up running additional things through this loop, such as your lavatories. So yes, quite literally, you can use the extra water produced by your duplicates to flush away heat. Mm -hmm. I love a good heat flusher. You hear that, Clay? That's the sound of all your patch notes flushing away. So what are the outputs like? Well, as you can see here, for every 1,000 grams per second of lumber, we will produce 162 watts of power. It actually went up by adding the hydrogen cooling loop over here. And we're producing 167 grams a second of oxygen. The dirt still remains the same at 341, and we're using just a little bit of filtration medium over there at 38 grams a second. So that's an overview of how these two systems work together to convert lumber into cool oxygen. So in practice, this is what it looks like. This room over here runs at about 40 degrees Celsius. You can see the equipment inside of there. I'm using a radiant cooling system. So essentially I'm running these pipes around um, granite tiles right here. I did a whole video on that. You can check it out up over here. And that's keeping all of the equipment inside of here nice and cool. As that cooling loop runs around here, you can see that it's still very, very cold. And I'm running oxygen past this using radiant pipes. So the oxygen, even though it's flowing in at a relatively hot temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, by the time it makes it out, it is a frosty 14 degrees Celsius. Now you don't have to run it that cool. You can actually run it a little bit hotter. I'm just doing this as a matter of demonstration. So while this thing is cool and all, the numbers that I'm actually producing down here are really not that significant. It's fairly easy to get this much cooling. Uh, it's a lot easier to generate more oxygen or power, you know, just like this over here. And in most bases, that would be very easy to do. The bigger problem I was trying to solve here was how do I create a system that gives me a net cooling and produces extra oxygen if I were to build it only using the forest biome materials. Because in the series that I'm making right now, I'm in the Oasis map. And one of the materials I don't have in the Oasis map is gold amalgam. So I have to go all the way to steel before I can even make something like this work. So therefore, based on the concept of this machine, I can use naturally growing trees to create net cooling, net power, net dirt, using up a bit of filtration medium in the process. So essentially what this means is that using nothing more than the starting forest biome, I should be able to build this machine and have a small self-sustaining base that can last thousands and thousands of cycles. That is until we eventually, somehow, possibly, maybe never run out of filtration medium. Considering it's the oasis and 50% of the map is sand and I can refine things like rock into sand, it, that probably will never happen. All right, so the metals used in this arrangement here contain zero high temperature stuff. So it contains no gold amalgam at all. So this right down here, is just gonna be made of aluminum ore. That right there is made of aluminum ore. And everything you see inside of here is either aluminum ore or copper ore, which can both be found in or nearby a forest biome. Okay, so now that we understand the concept and why I'm actually pursuing this thing, let me show you my arrangement that I have set up right here. It's not the most optimal, it's pretty much a prototype, but you'll get the idea of what's important here. So the ethanol distiller runs into a liquid tank down here. That way I can build up a surplus of ethanol. Because when this petroleum generator runs, it actually consumes a lot faster than the ethanol distiller can produce it. 
But the petroleum generator just runs every once in a while. You see it turns on and then it turns off. So as it's running, it's dripping polluted dirt, um, a polluted water right down here. And I have a hydro sensor that just detects every time we go above a certain amount, we click that pump on. Okay, so as the water runs out of the water sieve, it runs past this bridge, which gives the carbon skimmers the first priority of liquid. So if there is available space up here, the water will flow this direction first. Now I have two carbon skimmers. So you'd only need one to really keep up with everything as you see it right here. I like to have a little extra capacity, so I put two in there. This is just a loop. Water in, water out, and it runs right back to the water sieve. Now once this backs up, because it's no longer running, that water will run past the bridge and then flow on over here to the heat exchanger and then into the electrolyzer room. So here we can see the water is at 32.3 degrees Celsius. And then as it flows into here, it's now in an environment that's actually quite hot. So you can see inside of here, it's about 56 degrees up there and it's 73 down here. So based on how much heat we're actually trying to pull out of the environment around us will contribute to how hot this is. But as the water runs through here, it increases in temperature, exchanging that thermal energy, and then it runs right down here to these electrolyzers. So there's another important tidbit here if you've been playing for a long time. We used to be able to run really, really hot uh, water into the electrolyzer and then have it come out at about 60 degrees Celsius. Well, now it works like this. It will be at least 70 degrees Celsius on the way out, or hotter if the input material is hotter. So what this means is that if you're pumping in water that's you know, 80 degrees or 85 degrees Celsius, what you can actually end up doing is destroying the equipment and your pumps inside of here if they're not made of gold amalgam. So what I've done up here is I've put several limitations in place so that the water doesn't ever get too hot for a aluminum gas pump to handle. So it's important to note that I've put a hard limit on just how hot the environment can get up top here. That way the water that's flowing in here doesn't produce gas that's so hot that it destroys the electrolyzers or the gas pump. Now, if you can make that out of gold amalgam, which isn't available in my situation, then you gain an extra 25 degrees Celsius on top of that. So you can actually flow water in that's really hot and flush even more heat away. So how the gas flows in this arrangement here is that we have oxygen down below, right? And then we have hydrogen up above. And since two types of gases cannot be in the same tile, once I run this for a little while, since hydrogen comes out of the top, we end up with a hydrogen lock up here, so a gas lock. So everything up here is hydrogen. Oxygen is down here on the bottom. I don't need three pumps, I just have, it looked good. I'm only using one, <laughs> and I'm only using one up here. These are hooked up to two different automation signals. The one up top is set to 600, the one on the bottom is set to 1000. You can play around with those numbers, but I like those right where they're at. So you can see the oxygen here just flows out and then we'll exit the system down here at a nice cool temperature. But it's coming out at 61 degrees and by the time it makes its way out into the environment, well, uh, it's in the single digits now. Man, it might be running it a little bit too cold. So once the pressure is met by this Atmos sensor, the gas pump up here turns on. And in this situation, I run hydrogen into this loop up here. So it cycles around and around and the temperature keeps going up. So you can see that the hydrogen here is at 85 degrees Celsius. And then it's like 75 up top. So note that I'm bringing in the pipe and it's, it's only at the top here. Since there actually is a temperature gradient, it's hotter at the bottom, 85 degrees, and then it's like 80 at the top. So as that loop runs around and around, I have a gas pipe thermal sensor right here and it's looking for anything above 80 degrees Celsius. So once that gas becomes hot enough, which it should be right about now, that sensor activates a gas shutoff valve, and then the gas flows out of here and then runs into a hydrogen generator where it gets converted into power and we remove the heat from our system. Now there's probably a thousand ways to set up your power grid. This is just kind of how I set mine up in this example here. I have all of my generators on a heavy watt wire just like this, and they feed several different power transformers that run off to various pieces of equipment. However, I have two smart batteries down here, just like this. The one that's hooked up to the hydrogen generator has a load threshold of 75, and the one that's hooked up to the petroleum generator has the low threshold a little bit lower at 50. The reason it's set up like that is because I want to remove the hydrogen from this loop first before I actually pull in more power from the petroleum generator. On this automation signal from the hydrogen generator, so if we're like at maximum battery, I will actually activate the power transformer here and that's where power runs out. So that's powering these lights or whatever else I wanted to power in my base. 
So that's power out. But like I said before, there's other ways to do this. Uh, you, ultimately, all you need to do is keep this equipment cool, and then you output some nice cool polluted water, and you can scrub away all of the carbon dioxide. So if you want to use something like a steam turbine, or maybe ice machines, or maybe have a cold biome, all of that can replace all of this stuff. So yeah, it's a complicated arrangement, but you know what? It was a fun puzzle to figure out. And we'll see how it works in my next playthrough when I try to tackle the Oasis map. So there you have it, guys. If this looks like the channel for you, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button. I'll see you again next time. Stay awesome, guys. Peace. Brothgar, out.